Welcome to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. I'm your host, Tim Reed. And once again, I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. Now, it's pretty crazy that we are almost all the way through our seven-step sales process. And I'm, I'm really excited about the feedback I'm getting from you guys that these steps are helping you think through sales in a way that you haven't before. So with that in mind, we're going to do a quick recap, jumping through the first five steps in the sales process before getting to this one today. Now, remember a number of weeks back, we started with step one, which is greeting. How do we greet a customer and build rapport with them in a way that makes them begin to trust us? After that, we move into step two, which is understanding their problem. This takes a lot of time. We got to spend a lot of time asking good questions and listening to really get a sense of the underlying problem of why the customer is coming to see us. After that, we move into step three, which is advise a solution, which following that, we go to step four, make a plan, giving them three simple steps they can take that will lead to their problem being solved. After that is step five, which is call to action. And we had an amazing conversation last week with Louis Falco about this, where we talk about stepping up to the plate and asking the customer for the money. With all that in mind, that brings us to today, which I would say is one of the most neglected parts of the sales process, which is pursuit. And this is the step that involves following up with the customer again and again and again to close that sale. Now, I'm going to be super honest that in most companies, this step doesn't exist. And it's actually hard to say whether this step or the understanding step is more neglected because frankly, most companies don't do either. The reason that I said back in that episode that understanding was the most neglected step is because if you don't understand the customer's problem, chances are you're not even going to get to the point where you can actually follow up with them. But I'm telling you, most companies in our industry do not follow Follow up, And this is low hanging fruit if you want to find something you can do over and over and over that's honestly really simple, but that will have just an unbelievable result in the bottom line of your sales. Now, I was really excited for this conversation because Adam Cribb is someone who I met face to face back at HHT's Summer Summit in Minneapolis this summer. And I actually spent a lot of time talking with both Adam and Andy Hoffman, who are just doing an amazing job out at the fireside stores in the Twin Cities. And I was really excited to have Adam on to talk about follow up because this is something for him that he's been able to hone and craft and turn into a mechanism that has led to just gigantic sales for him. And it, you know, it's obviously making him some money and it's making a lot of customers happy. So this episode is really like boots on the ground. Adam is living and breathing this every single day. And I just, I feel like as I've listened back to this conversation, it is so practical. And I think it's worth getting out a paper and pen to take some notes on what he's doing because this is a big deal. You know, as as I've traveled the country over the last year and a half or so talking with businesses and manufacturers, what I truly believe is that our industry does not have a lead problem. We have a follow-up problem. It's not that we need more leads and more leads and more leads. I mean, hey, if you want to give those to me, I'll take them. But the issue is most businesses aren't following up on the opportunities that they have. So with that in mind, we're going to jump into the conversation. I'm really excited for you to hear this. At the end, I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about follow-up, and you're actually going to get to hear a little rant that I had a speaking engagement pretty recently when someone asked me a question about it. So I'm excited for you to hear this conversation. We'll circle back at the end and talk about it. Joining me from Roseville, Minnesota is Adam Cribb, who's a retail team member for Fireside Hearth and Home in the Twin Cities. How you doing, man? Great. Yourself? I'm good. Thanks a ton for coming on board today. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, I'm excited. Adam, this is going to be an awesome conversation because we've talked a decent amount over the last couple months about retail sales and kind of what it means to have a sales process that you follow. And today, we're going to really talk about follow-up in particular. But I want to ask you just for people that are new to this audience, how did you get into work in retail in the fireplace channel? I feel like that's a, a very obscure job that not many people set out trying to accomplish. True, true. Um, well, let's see. I've been this. I'm going on my fourth year now. And uh, long story short, uh, I would have gotten into it because my, my, my father, Dave Cribb, he was in the industry for a really long time. 
uh, we moved up north and to the north woods and <clears throat> he bought a, um, a marine up there, started selling boats and stuff and decided to open up a hearth shop as well. And so I worked there just a little bit, but not a ton, wasn't interested in it at all. <laughs> and I uh, went to school and all that and was doing different selling jobs, you know, door to door sales and all that, the, the rough stuff and asked for um, a meeting with uh, Jeff Thayer, uh, who's a family friend. I've known him literally pretty much my whole life and just wanted career advice. You know, sit down. What do you you know, what's out there? What do you think I should do? And uh, during that conversation, he's like, well, did you ever, you know, think about doing retail sales or selling fireplaces? I said, well, no, not really. <laughs> no. But he's like, well, there's an opening. Maybe you should apply. So kind of went through that process and got it, which is great and started out and really liked it. I started in a in the Woodbury uh, showroom where I worked there for, for maybe just three months or so and then transferred me down to Egan where I kind of got my feet wet and got, got some momentum going. And then they transferred me to Roseville where I'm at right now, just kind of the hub and all the action is because operations are there, uh, the install crews come out of their service, all that stuff. So um, and I've been rocking there for a while and just, uh, yeah, really, if you were to ask me 10 years ago, yeah, uh, what are you going to do? Never would have thought this at all, but I can't see myself doing anything else at this point. I don't want to do anything else at this point. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. And that's, that's honestly my exact, well, not quite my exact journey, but pretty darn close in that if you would have asked me when I was 18 years old, you know, what are you going to be doing when you're in your, you know, early to mid thirties? My answer would have been, uh, of course, playing rock and roll music all around the country. It would not yeah. have been selling fireplaces, but it's actually an awesome gig. And I mean, as, as the audience knows, it's something that obviously I love and I feel like it's a super fun industry and something that, I mean, can really set you up for a, for a great life. And I think it's just really fun. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I mean, 10 years ago, uh, I would have hoped to say I was doing the same rock and roll thing, but as you know, that's not, uh, doesn't always work. Yeah. Now I'm trying to remember, Adam, when did we first meet? Did, did we meet a couple of years back when I was in Minneapolis talking to the fireside stores? Uh, we did. Yeah. So we met, um, shoot, we were down at a summer function in Lake city actually. And you were doing a, a little presentation for all of the retail folks on how to sell to millennials and uh, met you there briefly. You flew out afterwards, so we didn't have a, uh, much of a chance to talk or whatnot. And then uh, just connected at Summer Summit this last summer, which was awesome to rekindle that, kind of start a conversation again. Yeah, that was awesome. So that was probably oh, six weeks ago now. We, we were in Minneapolis at Summer Summit, and, and it was awesome talking to you and Andy just about sales process and everything, because I felt like, you know, we, I felt like we really connected in that we're both, you know, young people. I think you're younger than I am, but you know, young people in this industry that are trying to make a go of it and are and are trying to think outside the box and ask questions and kind of challenge, like, what have we always done? And that that's been a super fun connection. So I love the conversation at Summer Summit. So for people that are listening to this, obviously, you know, you're in the trenches on like a day to day basis. You're working in the showroom and you're the person that is selling fireplaces and and making sure everything works for them. In your evolution of this, now that you're four years in, I just want to ask you, how has follow-up started to play into the success that you've had? Uh, it's been a huge player um, because, I mean, when I first started, I was just getting my feet wet and trying to just get the sales part down, you know, and when you're in front of the customer um, and didn't honestly focus that much on follow-up like I should have been. Since I've honed the craft, as you will, or whatnot, follow-up has become a huge, huge part of it, and I've actually seen the sales really take off and almost skyrocket since then. Just if somebody's coming in and you have their info or if you're getting a lead of some fashion, some way, there's a reason why and there's a reason they're giving it to you. So you'd be silly not to do anything about it. Yeah, I think so. And it's funny because like, so for me, this is my 15th year in the hearth industry. And the first four years was as an, as an installer and a service tech. And after that, I spent a lot of time in sales. And for the longest time, I just it was the mentality at our business, but but we just assumed that everybody that we quoted would just come back and buy, and and we would never call them. We'd put the bids in like a dusty folder o over in the corner, and someone would leave, and, and sometimes the owner would get kind of mad, and he'd come downstairs and be like, "Hey, what's going on with this? You know, why 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 are these bids in the in the folder?" And we'd be like, "Oh, don't worry, they're they're coming back in." And, mm -hmm. you know, and so for me, like, so six years ago when I, when I came over to the business I'm in now at Fireside and all of a sudden I'm running a showroom, I'm responsible for, for the results. I all of a sudden had to realize very quickly, no, people are not going to come back. You actually have to pursue the job. And if you don't pursue the job, like number one, you're going to lose. But number two, you're not a salesperson. You're just an order taker. If the only time you sell is when people come in one time, they buy and they're out. 
I would say unless you intentionally messed it up, they were coming in to buy anyway. You actually weren't selling them anything. Uh, oh, totally agree. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, there's 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 two totally different people there. Our salespeople is yeah, order taker and a salesman. Yep. Sales lady. Yep. Yeah, and and I feel like too, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being an order taker. I mean, if someone comes in, you want to be able to to capture that and not, you know, upset them to where they want to go elsewhere. But the reality is if you actually want to build a business for yourself in sales, understanding how to follow up and pursue not only just estimates that you've written up, but also new prospects that are coming in is absolutely critical. So I want to ask you, when we were talking on the phone about a week ago or so leading up to this conversation, you were telling me a little bit about how you manage your sales pipeline. So what, what's that look like for you and how has that evolved over the years for you as a salesperson? Sure. So so right now, um, well, I obviously keep a, an Excel spreadsheet on all my sales, where they're at with preview, preview not scheduled. Um, install, uh, cash and carry. So I track where I'm at for the month, where I'm going to be in the next couple months. Um, that's just me dorking out and needing to know, right? And actually listening to your podcast and see the way that you mentioned it was uh, you'd be you'd be surprised that if you were to walk into any showroom or any business and you talk to these salespeople um, and if you were to ask them, you know, what is your best prospect or what is your best lead that you've quoted in the last month? A lot of them really wouldn't know what they are. And I thought, I was like, you know what? I don't know what they are. I have a folder. I put them in and I jot little notes on when I followed up, but there's no, I wouldn't know. So I took it a step further, another Excel spreadsheet and when I write a quote, I put down obviously their quote number, uh, order number if it gets turned to that, the dollar amount so it's real, uh, product, uh, follow-up notes, and then I actually rate it on a A to D scale. On A being the best you know, prospect, they are going to buy, there's some silly reason why they didn't, or I need to follow up, it's going to happen. All the way down to D, and like you said before, Fs, we just try not to bid them because they're not going to happen anyways. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been tracking that, and I, I can't remember, maybe a month and a half now um, I've been doing it, and it's a lot of green on that <laughs> spreadsheet, which is good, but it's it's funny because when it's slow and you go back to track, you can go, you can look, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. I would have totally forgotten about this person, even though they're in my file. And this is the connection. This is what reminds me of them. The little note that I put down, you know, on, hey, they're going to Jamaica or, hey, they went on Alaskan cruise. So you have that connection sparks it. And then you can kind of tie that in when you follow up with them. So that's been a game changer for sure. But even more so, you know, before I started doing that, just touching base with them, uh, calling them after they come into the showroom and making the phone call. Email's great, but phone call's huge. Hey, Adam, following up with you, seeing if you had any questions. I know we talked a lot when we were in the showroom and we were looking at X and Y, just seeing if you had any extra questions for me that we didn't cover when we were here. They have life. I, I have life. You know, you forget what you talked about. There's a lot going on. Um, and just kind of refreshing that is good. So phone call, follow up. And then I start doing emails, seeing where they're at, stuff like that, and maybe a phone call or two after that. Well, and so the way that you're describing this, that's a pretty well-oiled machine that I'm going to say 99% of people in our industry don't do. So there's no way that this happened overnight. What was the transition in you starting to adopt this? And what was the kicker? Was it just, hey, I'm not selling enough. I need to make more money. Was it as simple as that? Wanting to win. <laughs> okay. I'm very competitive. I, I like to win. I like to sell a lot. After my first like full year I was at, I did 904,000 and I kicked myself because I didn't hit that million. Mm. And that's what really lit a fire under me because we had five retail sales reps hit a million and I was not one of them. Oh, yeah. And it was, it, it, it just crushed me, you know, cause I was so close 904,000, you know? Um, so I looked back and I tracked my months and I saw where it was slow and it was July and, you know, in the summer season where we can get a little lax. And yep. I said, it's not happening again. So I hit it hard and followed up and just started making it something I did. And it obviously made a huge difference because the next year, so my second full year, as it's because it's, I started at a, at a half year, basically. Yeah, yeah. But my real full year uh, hitting a million was my second year. And I, I did it. And I, that was a huge part of it for sure. Dude, that's so awesome. And so here's a question then, because as you're talking about this, I feel like so you mentioned how critical the phone call is, and I'm with you that the phone call is absolutely critical. Email's amazing too, but but I think there's something special to that phone call. One thing I hear a lot is salespeople are afraid to call because they think like, oh, the customer's just going to think I'm bugging them. Do you, do you get scared by that? No, not at all, really. Um, they've given you their phone number. They've given you their info. It's an invitation. I, I work with people that have a hard time doing it, and... I, so I understand it. And I used to get, 
yeah, a little nervous about it, but you just start doing it. It gets more comfortable. And hey, you're just calling because we made a cool connection in the showroom and we're friends now, yep. I'd like to think for the most, you know, and we're just, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing and see what your thoughts are. If you're ready to roll, if not, no problem. Hey, I'm not going to bug you. You let me know when it's a good time to call you back and we can kind of go from there. If you're not ready now, no worries. Life happens. I get that. But just let you know. Let me know when you're ready. You know where to find me. Dude, that is amazing. And I think so many salespeople have to get over the fear of calling people. They just get afraid that people are going to think they're bugging them. But it's exactly like you said. I mean, they gave you their phone number. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and I know for me, like I'm so busy. If you don't call me, like I'm not going to buy. I'm too busy. I'm moving on to the next thing. I think I think Carter and Taylor talked about this last season in their episode about how we make the mistake of assuming that the fireplace sale or their interaction with us is the most important thing that's happened to them this week. And they just can't get it out of their minds. But it's not the truth, right? Not at all. Not at all. This is just another stop, you know, especially with people remodels, you know, they're picking out flooring, they have other things going on. Fireplace is on the back burner because again, you don't have to have a fireplace. Unfortunately, you do not have to have a fireplace. I would like it if it was mandatory, but, um, you know, so it's, they don't have to buy. This is a, not a purchase that is a must. No, totally. It's a luxury item. Now I want to ask you then, do you think, so how often is too much to follow up? So that's something that uh, I've actually been thinking of lately, and it, that's a tricky question. Uh, seven, obviously, is good. And then on top of that, when I get those e-leads, I'm calling them, man, if I can, in two minutes, right away. You said two minutes? Two minutes is, is it's realistic. Now, here's the issue. I mean, we all get busy. It's tough. And this time of the year, it's, it's nuts. We're starting our state fair sale. This is the big time to buy a fireplace in Minnesota. So we have people flooding in the showrooms and we're getting a ton of leads, but following up as soon as possible. So two, two minutes, five minutes, for sure, you're getting a phone call from me and then a follow-up email. And recently, Andy and I were literally just talking about this with the amount of leads coming in. That phone call is getting people to buy right away because they're still at their computer. They just clicked send on giving them or giving us their information and it's fresh in their mind. So you can see what they're looking for, get the notes to make a job site so that when they come in, you have, you know what they're looking for and schedule an appointment in the showroom. Just boom, boom, boom. That's awesome, man. I think that's amazing call within two minutes. So I, want, I cut you off here. So I want to go back to, so how often is too much to follow up? Um, so, I mean, that's a tricky thing. I'd say, I mean, too much, I don't know, every day. That's, that's crazy. You know, that's, that's too much. Me as a consumer, I would, that would be annoying. If you were calling and emailing me every day, I'm turned off. That's too much. I haven't found that yet. <laughs> the, where, where the balance is or where the cut, cut point is. Cause honestly, usually they're going to tell me that they're not interested anymore or they're going to buy by the time it gets to be too much. Dude, I think, so that's where I, that's where I was going and you just hit it on the head and confirmed it. So this is my take. My take is, you know, I don't think you can go too much because they'll let you know if they're not interested. And and I think that like realistically, we're probably too busy to call them every single day anyway. I mean, maybe every single day is a little bit too much. But the reality is if you're calling them every, you know, every three days, just checking in, the, they're going to tell you when, when, the, when they're not interested anymore. They're going to tell you when they're off the market. But in all reality, have you ever had a person that has been annoyed because you followed up too much with them that you can remember? Um, no, I, I haven't. Uh, that was my fear, I'd say, when I started following up like religiously that I was, oh, man, I'm just going to annoy them. I don't want to I don't want to make anybody mad or turn them off from actually buying. But no, like you said, they're going to tell you they're not ready or, you know, we're, we're going to look at something else, maybe do it next year or they're ready to go. There's pretty much two avenues there. Yeah. I'm, I, I forget what episode I said it in, but it was Ray Edwards. He talks about how you got to follow up with someone until they fly, buy, or die. And like, I think that's, exactly. I think, I think that's yep. pretty dead on. Yep. So this, here's a funny story, because I'm, I'm just convinced on this, on this follow-up thing, you have to pursue the job over and over and over. And, and very often, the data says that people only come into a horror store 1.4 times before making a purchase. And, and I found that very much to be true, is that, is that if someone comes in and they walk back out, they're probably not going to come back. And so you got to get a piece of contact information to pursue the job because people are busy. If someone comes into the showroom and, and we say, Hey, you know, how are you guys doing? What brought you in here today? Is this your first time in the showroom? And they say, no, we've actually been out shopping around. It's our second time back in that clues you in. They're here to buy. And, and perfect. <laughs> I mean, seriously. And I think that yeah. there's something to that, that like you got to pursue the jobs because people are so busy. They're not coming in five or six times anymore. True, true. Yeah, everybody that's coming in is, everybody says it, they're a lot more well-versed 
hooked on the product. They're doing their research. They're looking online. They have an idea of what they're looking for. They're just ready to fill in the gaps, basically. Yeah, hundred percent. So I'll tell you a funny story here, and this is you know for for people in the audience that are afraid of that pursuing a job is going to blow up in their face. So this is my again like my fifteenth year in the industry. I have literally only had one situation where follow-up blew up in my face. I'm going to tell the story. I'll make it as quick as I can. Oh, but, let's hear it. Yeah. Okay, so so this this lady comes into the showroom, and I could tell from the get-go she did not want to talk to me. And I was the only person in there, and this is you know, a number of years ago. And uh, I, so I go talk to her, and I said, I said, hey, how are you doing today? She instantly throws up her hands. I'm, 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 not here to, I'm not here to talk to any salespeople. I don't want to talk to you or anybody. I'm just here to look. And I said, hey, no problem at all. You just take a look around. So she, she ends up looking at these gas inserts. And after a little while, I come over and I start straightening up brochures that don't need to be straightened up, you know, right next to the gas inserts. And, and I said, I said, well, hey, so do you have any questions about these? Nope, I don't have any questions. I don't want to talk to any salespeople. I'm not here to, to buy. I'm just here to look. And I was like, well, hey, that's no problem. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here to answer any questions if you have any. So she ends up asking me a couple questions and, and it leads into this amazing conversation about gas inserts. And she kind of puts her guard down and, and I think the conversation's going really, really well. So we talked for 15 minutes about these gas inserts and, and I asked her, I said, well, do you want me to write you up a, a proposal on, on this insert? Again, she throws up her hands. Nope, I don't want to. I'm not here to buy. I'm just here to look. And I said, I said well, you know, why don't they just write you something up so that way you can at least go home and you know what the price is. You know, and down the road you can decide if it's the right amount, if it's too much, if it's too little. But you know, by the time you leave here, it's so easy for the numbers all just to jumble together and you can't make sense of anything. So she sits down and I wrote, write her up a proposal. She leaves. So a couple of days later, what do I do? I get on the phone. I call her up. The second I called her, she started ripping me up and down for <laughs> for giving for giving her a call, and I and and I mean she let me have it, oh, and man. and I she said you're a sleazy salesperson, you're just trying to get me to buy. I told you, and and I said I you know I'm so sorry. I just I wanted to call and just check in. I thought we had a great conversation. I just wanted to check in. You know I'm, I'm sorry. I won't, I won't bother you anymore. So you know hung up the phone. A second later, the phone rings at the showroom, and on the caller ID I can see it's her number. I happen to be working with a guy. He's an older gentleman that I've talked about on the show before. He's an amazing salesperson. And while the phone's ringing, I kind of fill him in. And I'm like, dude, you got to you gotta pick up this phone, not me. So he picks, <laughs> he picks up the phone and, and, uh, and he listens. And this lady just starts going off about me. And it's funny because like, you know, I'm his boss. But he starts listening and goes, yeah, you know, yep, Tim is one of our young guys. You know, and, you know sometimes he, he gets... <laughs> you know, he gets a little bit too hungry, you know, and I mean, you just gotta, he's just, he's just a young guy and I'm, I'm sorry about this. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to find a way to make this right. I, I actually happen to be the pricing supervisor and I'm going to find a way to make this right. Thank you so much for the feedback. I'll, I'll call you back. So he waits about five minutes and he calls her back and he says, you know, I, I was looking over the proposal that Tim wrote you up and I'm, I'm just embarrassed to say this as the pricing supervisor, but he he actually overquoted you by one hundred and fifty dollars, and I am I am I, I'm so I know that you don't want to buy from us. I I am just so sorry, and I had to let you know that he overquoted you by one hundred fifty dollars. I know you don't want to, but if you did want to come in and do business with us, we'd be able to save you one hundred fifty dollars on that on that gas insert. And he uh-huh. talks to her for a little bit, hangs up the phone, and he goes, "Tim, you better find somewhere to go. She's driving over now to buy it." <laughs> So, right. so no, <laughs> that's no, awesome. That's a great story. So no joke. I literally had to go hide in the closet next to my office in the showroom because there's nowhere I could go. This lady goes in and buys the insert right. from him. So for anyone that is scared to follow up, number one, I guarantee you it cannot go as badly as it did that day for me. But number two, the follow up actually still sold the job. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's hilarious. It was pretty awesome. So, so rounding out, I want to just ask you, you know, what, what would you say to, to people that are in the industry in a sales position that, that want to grow their sales? How should they start thinking about following up? So every morning when I get to the showroom, I'm checking emails, I'm making a list of everything that I need to do and follow ups absolutely on that list. Again, I use your rating A through C for that. <clears throat> that that ends up in the B category because obviously if I have issues with jobs or things that I need to figure out, that takes, you know, the front line. Sure. But just doing it every day and just making it a part of what you do because people say they don't have time. You're just not making time for it. It's part of it's part of the sales process and this is a big game changer in that process. I mean, you'd be silly not to. So just make it something you do and then it becomes natural and you have time at that point all of a sudden. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And, and I love, so I want to circle back here. So at the beginning of your day, you're making a list. You're proactive on this is what I'm going to go tackle today. 
Yeah, yeah. I just I do well with lists. I, I get scatterbrained. I get excited. I start doing different things. And then before you know it, I forgot to call so and so. So I absolutely make a list every morning, hands down, and then continue the list throughout the day. That's awesome. I'm the same way. I get I get scatterbrained unless I have something that's like directing my attention in front of me. And and circling back too, so you you mentioned that follow ups come in a B category. So you rank your days on an A B C D scale. Yeah, not to dork out even more, but I actually got that from you and listening to your podcast because before it was a list and it was a long list. And oh my gosh, where do I start? You know, okay, I know this is pretty important, but oh yeah, I have this over here, and oh maybe I should do this. It just takes, it just dumbs it down. You know, you look, you got a big A there. All right, those are getting crossed off before anything else gets crossed off. And then you just kind of go down your day. And obviously, well, in my situation, the A's are some of the toughest things too. Like a phone call you really don't want to make. Yep. But if you sit there and think about it all day, it makes it worse. So just tackling that phone call, that collection, they owe us $3,500. The job's been complete. You know, my accounts receivable department is on me for it because we didn't collect. That's got to get done right away because it just gets worse the longer you wait. Dude, that is so awesome. And I think, again, there's there's, there's just not many people doing this. I'm so glad that we had this conversation because I think that a lot of people listening to this, both sales people and sales leaders, they're, I think their brains are going to be humming on how can I start to give tools like this to my team where they can set up their day, they can mark their priorities. Because I think that this is is how you win. It's being super proactive. You're not just reacting as the day comes in. You're going out and, and crushing it on purpose. So have you always been that way or is that something that you've just like learned more and more over time? I've honed it more and more over time, but it started, it started out, uh, funny story, growing up, my dad telling me in the morning, so I don't know, you're like eight years old, it's summertime, yeah. and he's like, hey, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, okay, yep, for sure I'll do it. And then he comes home and it's not done. All right, well, I'm in trouble. You know, that's my fault. I've disappointed you. Just write it down. And he found out a long time ago that that's the way to get me to do something is make a list. It was always make a list. So I've been making lists my whole life. I want to throw something at you here. So I went to Bradley Hartman's Sales Fundamentals Workshop in April of last year. And he had something that was so awesome that I ripped off 100%. So he was he was on the podcast a couple episodes ago. And so he knows I've ripped this off from him. It's okay. But he talked about making a weekly play call sheet. And so what I've done is I've taken his idea and modified it for our retail team to where on Monday mornings, the team has this templated sheet where they have to write down, you know, 10 jobs that they want to try to move from just a written estimate into an in-home preview. And then they have another list that's 10 jobs that they want to move from the completed in-home preview into a deposit this week. And then they want to make a list of five customers from the, the last you know few months that they want to call and say thank you to. And anyway, the whole thing is about basically on Monday morning, planning out your week so that you've always got this play call in front of you. And this doesn't account for like the random stuff that comes up. But you know, on Monday morning, you're just saying, hey, you know, this is my this is my play call for the week. And if I don't get through it, that's okay. But this is I'm just gonna every time I have I have a little bit of downtime, I'm just gonna knock out a couple of these things. And we actually started tracking follow-ups with customers through our play call sheet as part of our weekly scoreboard. And that's been, a, that's been a really, really fun thing. But I want to bounce it off of you. What do you think about the idea of like on a weekly basis, if sales leaders had their teams do this, do you think that'd be effective for a lot of folks that maybe struggle with organization? I, I think it'd be a great idea um, just because, the, and we're all guilty of it. Downtime comes, it's like, whew, you want to, you know, sit back in the chair a little bit, relax, you know, and I don't know what to do next. Well, with that, you always know what to do next or where your best, you know, uh, where you should focus your, your next activity. But that's, I mean, that's a huge thing for sure. Well, Adam, it's been amazing having you on the show today. I just want to, I want to tee you up. Are there any closing words you have for folks who are in your shoes? I mean, we are in the heart of the busy season. Stuff is getting crazy right now. What word do you have for folks that are selling retail? So no matter how hard it is to do that follow-up when there's you know four people stacked behind you, just do it. I, I'm going to quick say uh, something. So at Summer Summit, I got to sit through Mind the Gold, Converting HHT Leads to Sales. Yeah. And there was a gentleman in the back, unnamed, who was complaining and saying, we just do not have time for this. We get so busy. My salespeople can't follow up. You know, we just don't have the time for these, you know, and didn't really understand how important it was. And Tia's dad, forgive me, I can't Tom remember Withers. his name, but he, that's it. He came back and kind of drilled into him a little bit. And I was about to, but he was the best person for it instead of some 30 year old young punk kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he just let him have it. He's like, I guarantee that my people are as busy as yours. And we are selling probably more than you are. And we do it. We have a way to make it happen. So you're not doing it. There's just no excuse. There's no excuse. 
it's literally free money. You know, a lead is a lead. They're ready to go. They've given you their information. Follow up on it and basically stroke it until it's a sale or not. 100%. And I, I said that was gonna be the last question, but you just, you teed me up for something else. And so it's not gonna be, <laughs> but, but I feel like when, when I hear it all the time, I don't have time to follow up on leads, especially in the busy season. Or, hey, Tim, this will work when I'm slow. This won't work when I'm busy. And my answer is, well, guess what? If you don't have time now, it means you don't have time to make money. And the reality is, mm-hmm. like, how long does it take to call a customer? 10 seconds? I mean, honestly, yeah. it takes zero time. It's not a game of time. It's a game of discipline. And worst case scenario, you stay an hour late in the busy season when the store is closed and you make your calls then. I mean, I'm sorry, but if you want to make money for your family, if you want to help people have the solutions that they need for their home, this is what it takes. There's just no way around it. Absolutely. If you want to win, make the call. Yep. So, okay. The other thing I want to talk about, because it's, it's so good that you teed it up in that conversation. Everybody says, I don't have time. My people are busy, blah, 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 blah. So I'm not joking. In the last six weeks, I've had meetings with the presidents of three of like the, the major companies in our industry, like manufacturers. And what I've been trying to communicate is you have to teach your dealers to follow up because no one's doing it. I mean, seriously, like what you're doing and what you're talking about, this is like the 1% of our industry. And I'm telling these companies, like you have to get your dealers to start following up because no one's following up. If you send them a lead, maybe they're calling back once, except for like 1% of your dealers that are actually being diligent. And those are the dealers that are knocking it off the ball. And as a manufacturer, you've got so much opportunity. If you can start to teach your dealers how to do this, teach them how to handle your leads, because ultimately your dealers are the people you're relying on to sell your products. Absolutely. Well, Adam, it's been amazing having you on. I'm so thankful for the time, and it's just been awesome over the last few months getting to talk to you about sales. Thanks again for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Adam. As I listen back to it, holy cow, I think there is some gold there. And it's worth thinking about what he's saying because this can make a huge difference in your sales. So, Before we get into the rant that I promised you at the beginning of the episode, a couple things that I want to talk about when it comes to following up. One of the owners at Fireside gives this analogy all the time to picking raspberries. And he always says, you know, when I was little, I used to go out and pick raspberries. And I'll tell you what, it was a lot easier to pick them when my bucket didn't have a hole in it. And and that's the truth. You know, sales is the same way. At a, a company I used to work for, we had a dusty bin full of quotes in the corner of the office. Office, and no one ever followed up on them. We would just write them up, and if the customer didn't buy, we'd put them in there. And the truth of the matter is that by not following up, we actually had a giant hole in our raspberry bucket, and we were just trying to cram more raspberries in while they were leaking out the other side because we never followed up. One of the things that is not talked about much in our industry is the idea of a sales funnel. And this is really important to think about. So imagine a funnel. And imagine it's, it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom, and it's got like three or four sections in it. So you should be thinking about your customers in terms of a sales funnel and thinking about what stage of the funnel are they at. So maybe at the very top of the funnel is all the customers that come into your showroom. And a little further down is the customers who you've written an estimate up for. A little further down is the customers who maybe you've scheduled the in-home visit for. And then finally at the bottom is the customers who have decided to purchase from you. Well, the truth of the matter is that it is easier to sell to customers who are already in the funnel than people who are outside of it. So it's way easier to sell to someone and get them to buy when you've actually written the estimate and completed the in-home visit. And what happens so often is we write the estimate for a customer, we let them go out the door, and we never call them back. But they're way deeper in the funnel than someone that's never even heard of our business, and we put all this focus and effort on marketing and advertising and focusing on the people walking in the door I'm not saying that that's bad necessarily, but man, the low hanging fruit is the people who are deep in the funnel. And frankly, thinking about your customers in different stages of the sales funnel and trying to figure out how to advance them down it through follow up is really important. And truth be told, it's the difference between being a salesperson and an order taker. So those are really important things with follow up. Another thing as well is that you always want to have a reason. So I mean, frankly, just calling a customer and saying, hey, I want to check in, that's better than nothing because a lot of people in our, in our industry don't even do that. But if you can find a reason to call them, it is so powerful. Like if you wanted to check in and say, 
hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I was going through our past installs and I found one that looks just like what you described in your project. I wanted to call you and and send this to you because I just think it's so awesome. By the way, have you had a chance to think about your estimate? That's a great reason to call a customer. If you can find a reason, it it is so effective with your follow-up. Another thing is, I think that the old adage is really true that you need to follow up until they fly, buy, or die. And that really is the truth. I would continue to follow up over and over and over and over again on your opportunities. Now, I'll preface that and say on your best opportunities. If something is not one of your best opportunities and if you don't really want the sale, then I would not follow up on that. But if this is a good opportunity, do it again and again and again and again. The truth of the matter is that the customer will tell you and you honor that request. It's the right thing to do. I I might have told this story before, but I think it's worth saying again. We had a salesperson that worked for us one time that actually got upset at people that were going to sell him hardwood floors because they didn't follow up with him. And he was really busy. He didn't have time to go back in. And he ended up actually not buying his hardwood floors because no one ever called him to follow up. So there's ways to do this, but I'm just telling you, if you can build a systematic follow-up process, you know, maybe you use a CRM computer software system, or maybe you just log all of your opportunities in a spreadsheet or even just on a handwritten piece of notebook paper, find a way to log your opportunities, mark what stage of the sales funnel they're at and where you're trying to advance them to. So something that's really helpful is say that your pipeline stage is like ours, where stage one is getting an estimate, stage two is getting out to the house, and then stage three is a deposit, make a list of 10 customers that are all at stage one that you need to move to stage two and make all your calls at once where your message is the same to every single customer. Hey, would you like to get that in-home visit booked? Hey, would you like to get that in-home visit booked? Hey, would you like to get that in-home visit booked? And then when you're done with those, you can move on to all of your customers who are at stage two, who have had the in-home visit done and they're ready to put down the deposit. Now you can make all those calls all at once. And you're saying the same thing every time you're asking for the money. When you can batch work like that, it makes you really effective. Now, I I truly believe that sales is really about 10% what you do on the showroom floor, and I think it's 90% in how you follow up, how you interact with your emails, how you interact with your phone calls and your spreadsheets. It, It really is, and this is what can make you an absolute rock star that can sell more than anybody else. (laughs) So I promised at the beginning of the episode that I would play you a rant. So uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Arizona with my friend Grant Falco, and we got to go speak for the Arizona HPBA, and the event was held at Arizona Fireplaces. And I'm I'm just going to preface this and say that, man, what an amazing operation those guys have down there. And Keith Richardson kind of purposely teed me up during a QA and a that we were doing. And he kind of goaded me a little bit to just go off the rails about follow-up. So I proceeded to do just that. So I'm going to play this rant for you and then we'll end the episode. But I'm going to preface it by saying that this was the culmination of really about four hours of me and Grant talking throughout the day. It was a small, intimate audience. And even though it sounds really intense, hey, there's a little bit of hyperbole going on here. And I want you to know this is coming from a heart of love. So basically, Keith teed me up and he asked, is it really important that we follow up with our customers? And it kind of sent me off the deep end a little bit like this. Do you want to take this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come on court. So you, you go first. <laughs> okay. So Grant took it at first and then turned it back over to me. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go off the deep end here. Cause I'm so fired up about this. You, I've been like at an eight so far. I'm going to get to a 10. Okay. <laughs> Guys, here's the truth. Businesses in our industry don't follow up with customers. They don't follow up with customers and it is insane. It's freaking insane. The fact that someone would come into your business, spend 45 minutes with you getting confused about BTUs and vertical termination, let a stranger come into their house for an hour, and then allow you to send them an estimate for $5,000, and you never call them back, is crazy. I'm just saying, it's crazy. And yeah, we're not corporate. We're, we do things our own way. We're not. We're low pressure, guys. If you follow up with your so no joke, I, if you're a salesperson that is not actively, systematically following up with your customers, you can two x your sales next year by following up. 
That's that is zero exaggeration. You can 2x your sales next year by following up. There's a lot of ways to do it. But we had a, we had a you know, I think about this. Like salespeople are afraid to do it because there's the rejection. Like, well, if I follow up, you know, they could tell me no, they could tell me to go screw myself or to stop calling them and get over it. It doesn't matter, right? So the whole thing is like they're coming to you. They know what business you're in. They know that you're going to try to sell them a fireplace. And they've still said, here's my address, here's my phone number, here's my email. They expect you to call them or to email them. They'll tell you if they don't want to buy. And guess what? You listen. You say, hey, no problem. I was just checking in. You let me know if I can ever help you. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that rant. You know it was coming from a heart of love. And I'm thankful to Keith for everything he did to get me and Grant out there to speak. It was just a total joy to go to Arizona Fireplaces. So with that in mind, I hope this episode was a blessing for you. And I hope it encourages you to go out this week and start systematically following up with your customers. As always, I am so appreciative of the audience that listens to this, and I'm thankful that you're allowing this content to help you move the needle in your business. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. To learn more, visit the website, itsfiretime.com. Music from this episode was written and recorded by In Bloom out of Portland, Oregon. We thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, And the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. We'll see you next time.